Hello, boys and girls, it's Fog, and welcome back. I'm in my single player world in the latest snapshot, and I'm standing next to my silverfish cannery. Those of you that have been watching my videos will recognize this. Many of you have asked for a closer look at how I put this together, so I thought that I'd put together this tutorial video. But before I do, Let's get a few things out of the way first. The idea for this cannery came from Ethos Lab, of course. Ethos been building one of these in his SP world for a while now, and I was so intrigued by the idea that I decided to build my own. I benefited quite a bit from his idea, so some of this might look familiar. That said, the guts of this machine are mine, and I spent a lot of time perfecting what I'm about to show you. In fact, I just recently redesigned and upgraded the entire machine, and it now runs pretty much flawlessly. Silverfish Cannery is a lot of fun to build, but it isn't particularly practical on version 125. The goal here is to package up enough silverfish to get a full level enchant, and doing that on 125 requires about a thousand silverfish. Now letting all those blocks out at once, and it's pretty hard not to once you get them started, is almost certain to lag your machine pretty badly. And filling up a 12 by 12 by 7 storage room full of silver fish blocks can take up to three hours. So it's not really a very efficient mob system. Now in the recent snapshots and eventually version 1.3 this is a different story. The changes in the enchant rules and the XP levels mean that you only need about 180 silver fish to max your levels. Canning that many silver fish only takes about a half an hour and letting them all out will most likely not lag your machine. It's also a nice number to lead around with you if you want to use them as diggers, so long as you're very careful about how you do it, because they will kill you. <laughs> Although I must say, my experiences with uh, using them as a mining tool have been a little less than satisfactory. These little buggers are really hard to get to do what you want. It works, and it can be a lot of fun, but you really end up with something that looks more like Swiss cheese than a cleanly mined area, and if you're looking for efficiency, a highly enchanted pick really makes for a much better mining tool. Now, I'm going to be using version 125 on this build so I can take advantage of the single player commands mod to help make the video. After all, I've already built this once using legitimate means and there's no need to make both of us suffer through my doing that again on camera. But this also, the stuff I'm going through today also works fine in the snapshot builds. In fact, it even works better in the snapshot builds. And it works, and it should work great in one in 1.3 once it's out. So anyway, let's get started. So if we want to build a silverfish cannery, the first thing we need to do is find a silverfish spawner. And if we want to find a silverfish spawner, that means we have to find a stronghold, and that means we need Eye of Ender, which means we need to combine Ender Pearl and Blaze Powder in a crafting window, just like this. And now we have a bunch of Eye of Ender. Then all we have to do is take our Eye of Ender and throw it in the air and let it guide us to the stronghold. Once we find a place where the Eye of Ender are going down instead of up, we know we've found the right place to dig. So we should be directly above a stronghold right here. So let's dig down. And there you go. There's the silverfish spawner. Now all we need to do is encase that in a material that the silverfish won't spawn in. Uh, I like to use netherrack just because this is going to be temporary and netherrack is so ugly that I know I'm going to remember to remove it later. Uh, netherrack makes really good scaffolding. While we're at it, I figured I'd take advantage of using single player commands to clean out a whole chunk of the stronghold here so that we can actually see what I'm doing. Okay, the area that you need to encase is three tall and eight by eight, and it's centered upon the lowest X and Z coordinate of the spawner. So if I turn turn on F3, you'll see that my X goes up as I go in this direction. There are three blocks on that side and four blocks on that side. And my Z goes up in this direction, three blocks that way, four blocks that way. So you end up with an 8x8x3 eight by eight by block of whatever your material is. The next thing that I like to do is I like to cover that block of temporary material with glowstone lamps. And I'm then going to place down enough redstone and a lever to light the whole thing up. 
I'll put my lever over here on this side, we'll turn it on to start, and we'll start wiring up with redstone until the whole thing is lit, just like that. Now that the lights are on, the next thing is to build the outside of the spawn box. And the easiest way to do that is to just put sandstone around here. Now you'll notice that I'm leaving the end portal and I'm leaving this back end out. Uh, there's no way to remove the end portal without cheating. So we're going to leave it in. Also, I've activated the end portal before I build my spawn box because I might want to actually use it to go into the end. With it activated like this, I can still leave this last little bit out. Um, it's not really a big deal that it's not completely using all of the spawning area because with the end portal there I'm gonna have to work around that area anyway so it's not really that much of a concern. I'm gonna lose that area anyway to the end portal. Once I have it encased like this I can go ahead and remove the scaffolding material. And there's my spawn box. Now we're going to want this area in here to be able to get pitch black when we turn out the lights. Uh, unfortunately, the end portal emits a bit of light, so we need to cover up the end portal, which is a bit of a shame because that means we're going to lose even more of our spawning area, but it really can't be helped. So go ahead and cover that all up. just like that. And the next thing that we need to do is we need to lower these sides by two so that we have room to build a waterway underneath. All right, when we're done with our encasing our spawn chamber, we should have a floor that is eight blocks wide and exactly eight blocks long. And then we're going to place water source blocks back in there so that it'll push any of these guys that spawn right up to this edge. So let's do that now. And then when we're done, we can close this off just like that. Hey guys, how you doing? The next step is to build a, a little spillway in the front to catch these guys as they come out and then push them over to the side where we will drop them down a chute into our infection chamber. Alright, and then finally a water source block right there will run the whole length of our containment system right to here. This is where our drop chute is going to be and below this we'll place our infection chamber so I'm gonna to have to move this floor down yet again alright now before we continue I wanna add one little feature here what you do is you go here and you put a fence post right there and put a pressure plate right on top of the fence post now what that's going to do is, as the silverfish come down here, they're going to bump that pressure plate, but they're small enough to actually slip under the pressure plate and down past the fence post down our chute. So every time they come down, they're going to bump that pressure plate, and we're going to know, hey, there are silverfish in our mechanism. And we're going to eventually wire that up to a fail-safe system which is going to detect the presence of silverfish and after a certain amount of time it's going to manually advance our machine just in case the other measures we've put in place don't work. Now in order to make that work really well we want to completely seal this area off so put a glowstone lamp right there and then go ahead and seal up the rest of it with glass now we have a bit of a problem. Whenever anything comes and hits that pressure plate, that pressure plate's going to activate the block it's in and it's going to 
also activate the block it's on, or the one where that fence post is. But we need to keep this area completely sealed or we're going to have silverfish coming out. So we need a way to get the signal from there out. And one really good way to do that is to use a good old silent bud switch. So I'm going to build an S bud right there. Place a piece of glowstone there, or you can use up down, upside down half slabs if you prefer, at least in builds where that works. And we're going to go ahead and put some redstone here, just like that, and put a torch right there. And okay, that obviously is not the correct orientation. If it flashes like that, then change your orientation and go this way instead. Of course, I could just add a couple extra blocks here, and, and uh, that would also work. And then I wouldn't have to rotate it, but it's really not that much trouble. And let's just make sure that our S-Bud works. We'll place a block right there, and that torch should flash. And it does. Okay, so now whenever anything activates that pressure plate, it's going to cause this glowstone lamp to turn on, which causes the, the block to change state, which will be detected by our block update detector. So we have a way of getting that signal out, and we'll hook all that stuff up later. Now, before we go any farther, I probably ought to stress that any building that you do in this machine needs to be on a material that cannot be infected by silverfish. These guys are persistent they will get in things you didn't think they will. They will escape, I promise you. At some point during your build, they'll get out, and they'll get into your blocks, and if your blocks have redstone on them, then when you summon the silverfish out to kill them, that's going to me mess up your wiring, and your machine is going to stop working, and you will be sad. So... You'll notice that I'm using primarily sandstone blocks. Uh, that's because I think they're very attractive. And uh, so there you go. So for me, my, ch my uh, material of choice is sandstone blocks and glass. But your mileage may vary. There is certainly nothing that says that that's what you have to use. Now the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to extend this chute down a little bit. We want to have at least two clear spaces here. Uh, then the next thing we need to do is we need to have a piston that's going to act as a valve to let silverfish into our machine. And we need a sticky piston right here, right beneath a block. And when the piston is up, it's going to close off the valve, it's going to push the silverfish up and away from the infection point, where we, which will be right here. There'll be a, a smooth stone block right there beside the piston. When the piston is down, then the silverfish will be dropped down to this level, where they can infect that block. And we'll use a bud switch to detect when the block is infected, and uh, do whatever we need to do to push this piston back up, get them away, advance a new block in and all of that, and you'll see how that works later. But first we need to finish building this containment chamber. You need to make sure this is surrounded on three sides by glass and on the fourth side by... whoops. <laughs> yes, I have extended reach on to make this a little easier to build. Uh, you need to make sure it's surrounded on three sides by glass and on the fourth by the infection block the infection point just like that and it probably wouldn't hurt to go a little uh, conservative here because these guys occasionally will glitch through corners so it does not hurt to put a little bit of extra little bit of extra stuff here and we'll go ahead and do this as well now, the smooth stone is going to be fed in from the back there, and it's going to be fed out in this direction. Okay, so somewhere back here, we need to build a smooth stone generator. And it doesn't really matter how far back you go for that, uh, just as long as you, uh, you, you make room for the generator. 
You can use whatever generator you want. You can use a smooth stone generator. You can use a cobblestone generator. Doesn't really matter. The important thing here is that it needs to be able to spit out a block of stone on demand. One other thing that I should mention is that silverfish have a way of glitching through corners. They have a way of glitching past pistons. I've seen my silverfish glitch past this this block right there and down through the piston even. And so uh, the other thing that I always have done is, and, and will do before I'm done here, is dig a pit out underneath this and also dig a pit underneath the infected blocks where you can uh, put lava so that if they do glitch through, instead of running amok throughout your system, they safely burn up in the lava beneath. But we'll save that for later. Now before we go any farther, I want to wire up this piston so that I can trigger it on demand. And I'm going to do that by hooking some redstone up to that block right there and then testing that it actually fires. And I need a torch. Thank you. There we go. So this is the way we're going to get power into the piston. Uh, on my other machine, I wired it from this side, and it I was kind of sorry I did. So this time, I think we'll come at it from this side. And then we'll go ahead and cover that up with glass. And uh, there we go. And now that we've got that ready and tested, let's build our smooth stone generator. All right, I am going to use my reliable smooth stone generator, which I've talked about in an earlier video. It's going to go right here on that little bit of cobblestone right there. And I've hollowed out this area to make it a little bit easier to see how all the workings go. And before I go any farther, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and put half slabs under this guy because I'm tired of seeing those silly raindrops drip on my head. Much better. We need a place right here to collect water. Like that. We need a block on this side with a repeater set to one tick. And we need a block behind it. Right there. And for now, I'm going to just put a switch on that to power it. We need a repeater down here set to two ticks. And we need a block here and a block here. And we need to put redstone dust on both of those, just like that. At this point, we basically have a smart piston. The next thing we need to do is put a place for our water. That's going to go right here. This is going to be our water source right there. We'll get rid of you and you. I want a block there. So that's where our water goes. Now we need a place to push a piston that'll push that block out once it's generated stone. So what we need is a regular piston. And it's going to go right there. That's where our regular piston goes. Next, we need to carry this signal up here to fire that piston. We're going to do that by putting a block there and another block right there. We're going to put a repeater set to three ticks right there. And we'll bring a block up to here. Whoops, wrong kind of block. We won't want you. And a block there and a little bit of redstone there and there. And that's going to fire that piston. Then we need to take that signal off here with a repeater and we'll wire that up later but we need to put in our lava supply and the lava supply goes right above that block right here so we're going to go ahead and build a box for our lava right here we're going to put gl uh, glass down the side just to make sure that that lava can't escape and And that lava goes right there, and it should form smooth stone, which immediately will get kicked out by the machine right now. 
And we'll go ahead and let that generate some smooth stone for a while until it maxes out. Okay. We now know that this is the farthest that that can push. And that's important because we're going to use this as uh, the corner of our storage room. But for now, let's just go ahead and build a smart sensor here so that we can tell when we've reached this point. And we'll do that just like this for now. And we'll wire that up to something later, but for now we'll just leave that there. And finally, I'm going to come over here and get rid of this switch. I'm going to build this into an RS NOR latch. And it'll go right there. We need a torch here. We need some redstone dust across the top. We need a torch down there. That gives us a NOR latch. Uh, the input to the NOR latch is right there. Uh, and actually, let's just go ahead and for now put a button there. Give me a button right there. And we need to get the power back over to this right here. And that will do the trick. So we should be good to go, except that I'm missing a bit of redstone dust here to complete the NOR latch. Just like that. Now if I hit the button, we should get one smooth stone block. There we go. One thing remains before I'm completely satisfied with what we're doing here with this smooth stone generator. Uh, as you can see, if we allow this thing to get to, the, to its maximum capacity, we can get into a state where we have a block up here. And then if that happens, even if I remove these, and try to advance the generator, it fails to advance because it's got a block up there and nothing is forcing this to push. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to modify the input just a little bit. We're going to get rid of that and we're going to put a switch, uh, a uh, repeater here set to some long pulse like say Vortex and we're going to pull a signal around to here and hook it to a repeater set to just one tick. That becomes our new input. Okay, for now, let's just uh, let's just put a block with a button out here so that we can trigger that quickly. Now, what's going to happen is if we get a very short pulse through here, that will fire, so that in the case where there's something jammed there, it has at least an opportunity to clear, and then we'll fire our normal NOR latch over here. That way, if this thing ever jams up completely, which it might do in the case where we've completely filled up our, our storage room, uh, we'll have a simple way to get the thing going again. Now, the, the danger here is that if these pulses come too quickly, this thing might fire prematurely when we're waiting for this to fire. Uh, that's going to not be a problem in this machine, as you'll see, because there are going to be enough delays before this pulse can occur that that won't bind up. But uh, let's test this and see if it works. And for, there we go. So it clears it out, and as soon as that f forms, it kicks out a new one. The next thing that we need is we need a way to detect when silverfish enter our infection block right here. And obviously that's going to need some sort of a bud. Now, you can use any kind of bud you want here, but ideally it should generate a very quick short pulse, a one tick pulse, and you'll see why in a minute. And since we need a bud with one tick, well, the logical choice is our old friend over here, the S bud. Um, but first, let's get this line out of the way so that we can build over the top of it without interfering with that and still have access to it. And I'm going to get rid of these two blocks right there because eventually I'm going to want to put lava under there as a failsafe for, uh, for if the silverfish ever accidentally get let out of these blocks. 
So we'll put this guy here and this guy here. And we already know from experience that we need to build this guy in this orientation in order for it to work. So this should, there we go, there's our bud. Now let's double check it, make sure it's really doing what we expect. Yep, it flashes. Okay, so we are good there. We're going to pull the signal off this line right here and hook it up through some redstone over to a single repeater set to one tick over here. Then we are going to hook that repeater up to a very simple flip-flop, just like that. Now, whenever anything triggers our bud switch, this flip-flop's going to change state. Just like that. Or like that. So we have a way to track the two different states. It will become apparent why we're doing that in a minute. Now, the reason we've left so much space here is because I want to put one other component in place. What I want to do is get rid of this redstone, put a little block there, and then we're going to build up, put a block right here, and put a sticky piston facing down right under that block. And then for now, let's just go ahead and put a lever on that, just like that. Now, what this gives us is this gives us a shutoff valve. So when this is gone, then even if we have uh, something triggering our bud, that signal can't get through to the flip-flop, and the flip-flop can't change state. But if this block is down, then any change here will still cause the flip-flop to change because the signal passes right through the block. So this gives us a convenient way to shut off the machine. Eventually we'll wire our on-off mechanism through here so that we can cut the machine's operation off completely. All right, there's one more large component that I want to build before we start hooking everything together. And this will probably look familiar to those of you that have been watching my videos recently. What we're building is a timer circuit, something that I like to call my magic triangle, Fog's magic triangle. And we're going to build this with uh, 10 repeaters at the base. So block, repeater, block, repeater, block, repeater. We're going to do this 10 times. Now, this element of the build is somewhat optional. What I'm doing here is I'm building a timer circuit that can be used as an anti-jam mechanism. This is going to be used to track when we've seen silverfish enter the machine. And if the machine hasn't advanced on its own after a set amount of time, then we're going to use the output from this timer to uh, go ahead and advance it manually. That way, if the machine ever jams for any reason, which they, it does, it might occasionally do. If it ever jams for any reason at all, then after a reasonable amount of time, it will unjam itself. This makes it much, uh, much more reliable. Uh, it means that you can go AFK, let the machine run all by itself, uh, secure in the knowledge that if anything should happen to jam the machine, you will never come back to your machine and find it loaded up with thousands of silverfish simply because you walked away and weren't around to unjam it. Now, this timer has to be long enough that it should, if everything operates correctly, never need to be fired at all. So that is why I'm building it so darn big. This, when it's done, will have 55 repeaters set at four ticks each. So if you do the math, that's 55 times four, which is 220 ticks. So that makes this a 22, uh, 22 second timer, which should be more than enough time for 
our silverfish to decide that they're ready to enter the blocks. All right, that should be done. Now, uh, just for a kind of final aesthetic touch, this is completely uh, unnecessary for the functioning of the machine, but just because I think it'll look cool, I'm going to go ahead and put torches on the other side of this as well so that while the machine is operating, it'll be easier to see what this thing is doing. Okay, now let's just real quick test this. Our input to this will be over here. And if I throw the switch, we should see all of those guys slowly turn off. And that tells me that I've missed a dot of redstone over here. Uh, I've put these on the wrong ones is what I've done. Okay. That's why we test. That's good. The final thing we need is we need a nor latch here. And we will build our nor latch right here. And we will run this off into a repeater right there. That's set. That's reset. And finally, we need to wire up our output, which we will wire up right here. Uh, we'll put a couple of blocks here. We'll put a repeater here, just to make sure that our redstone signal can reach all the way back down. And we'll build a very simple staircase right here to get it back down. Now we have all of our major components into place. Let's go ahead and start wiring some things up. So let's uh, first talk about uh, how this is supposed to operate. So when silverfish come down through here, they're going to hit this plate, and they're going to drop down in there. Now when it hits that plate, that needs to start our timer. So we need to hook the output of this, of this uh, pulse detector up to the reset switch of our timer. So let's do that right now. Up to the set switch, sorry, not the reset. This needs to set our timer. Now, when the timer finishes, we need to pull the signal off of here, and we need to run it over here and put it put a single tick pulse into this block. Now, there's lots of ways that we can do that. There's lots of crazy monostable circuits that we can use, but I want to use this one because it's kind of fun. Now, I got to warn you, this only works in certain orientations on 1.25 and earlier I mentioned that this machine works better in the new builds uh, in the snapshot builds one reason is that this glitch is kind of fixed in the snapshot builds this now works from any orientation in the snapshot builds at least that's been my experience perhaps I'm wrong but that's been my experience so if I put an input here I get a single pulse another input and I get another single pulse. And like I said, it only works from certain orientations in, in 1.25. You see, the pulse doesn't actually go through the block if I come at it from this side. So if you choose to use this monostable circuit, make sure you test it because it only is going to work from certain orientations. So anyway, that's where the output comes from. So when we get a reset signal, we want to pull this guy go through here, like this, right down to there, and put a torch right there. And now, when we reset, when we set our timer, the timer is going to go. And eventually, those torches are all going to turn out unless something causes us to reset the timer, in which case that aborts the timer. So if we turn on the timer, 20 seconds later, this should pulse. That actually glitched. We don't want that. That's because I placed that torch there. 
You can see those lights are going out. And then this is going to fire. Bingo. And now if we reset this and set that. There it comes back. Okay. So now we have a way to use our timer to trigger our state. All right, now that we have our anti-jam timer in place, we can go back to discussing how this machine will actually operate and wire up the rest of it. Um, so the silverfish spawn up in there. They come down through here down to the infection chamber. When that piston's down, they can infect this block. That will trigger our bud, which will fire our uh, flip-flop and change its state. Now, when this thing changes state, depending on the state on its state we need a couple of different things to happen the first time it changes we need to send a signal to raise this piston pushing silverfish away from the infection point and then after a short delay giving the silverfish time to actually be pushed away and and settle down because sometimes they can get jammed there if we push them up and don't wait long enough so after a short delay we'll send a signal over to our smooth stone generator which will generate another block of smooth stone which will advance this column over here now when the column moves it's going to fire this bud one more time because anytime this column moves it'll trigger that bud and that's going to send another pulse through here that's going to change our flip-flop again and when that happens we need to after a short delay lower that piston and the reason we need a delay again is because if we don't delay and we lower that piston too soon then it is possible that a silverfish could enter that block before this bud is prepared to respond to the change uh, anytime this thing changes state we're going to reset our timer so that uh, we'll know that hey, the thing that we expected to happen has happened, and we don't actually need the timer to fire now. All right, so now that we know how that's going to work, let's get busy wiring it. Whenever our flip-flop changes state, we need to emit a pulse, a single tick pulse, uh, depending on which way it's changed. And the easiest way to do that is with our old friend, uh, the edge detector. We need a dual edge trigger, dual edge detector here. We put that at one tick, put that at four ticks. Put a couple of blocks here. Uh, let's go ahead and put a torch there and a torch there and a torch there. And I will put a lever here so we can demonstrate how this works. Now, when it goes high, one torch flashes and when it goes low, the other torch flashes. And that's where we'll hook everything up. In order to control the up and down motion of the piston here, we're going to need a NOR latch. So let's build a NOR latch right here. There's our NOR, NOR latch. The top is set, and we'll raise our, to our uh, piston. The bottom is reset, and we'll lower the piston. All right, here we have all the wiring um, for the basic behavior of the of the flip-flop. I've removed that block so that the flip-flop won't change state on us while we dem while I demonstrate. Uh, now, uh, this one here is wired through a 12 tick delay to the set on our, uh, to the reset on our piston. This one is wired up through here through a three tick delay to the set on our piston uh, nor latch. The reason there's a delay here is because this nor latch needs a certain delay in order for it to actually take. Um, over here the same line is also wired over there through a 12 tick delay to there. So what happens is silverfish enters block, triggers flip-flop, flip-flop covers torch, turns this on like that, and that raises the, the that raises the uh, piston and spits out another block. Get rid of some of these. Then the block movement is going to come down here, trigger the flip-flop again. This is going to switch. It's going to reset the piston, which should be lowered now after a delay. So I'll stand over here and maybe it'll be easier to see the action. So entry, up, 
move after move that triggers the flip-flop again down after a delay now the last thing that remains is to take the output from both of these signals and to route it over here so that we can reset our timer okay here we have the line to our timer reset all we need to add is a repeater there at four ticks and a repeater there at four ticks. These ought to be four ticks to give this NOR latch a chance to actually change and for the signal to actually propagate through all of these four tick repeaters. If we make these shorter than four ticks there's a chance that this thing could change state too quickly and, and our signal might not actually reset our clock. It's a slim chance but I've seen it happen every once in a while. And now the wiring of the basic uh, Silverfish cannery is almost complete. All that remains is for us to add a master cutoff switch, which we're going to wire up to this right here. And here we have our master switch. This turns the machine on, this turns it off, and I'll show you how that's wired up right here. First of all, when the machine is off, this torch right here holds that piston up no matter what state the machine is in. We always want that piston up when the machine is off so that no silverfish can enter this block. Okay. It also pulls up this piston, of course, and it runs back here. It holds the reset line on our clock on so that even if we get pulses down through here, this clock can't be set, can't be started. And it comes up here and holds our lights on so that even if we turn this lever off the lights are still on. Now at this point we are pretty much ready to try it out but before I do I just want to mention one other thing I've added glass here this is around where our conveyor will go so that if we break yes 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 quit breaking down the doors you stupid zombies so I've added glass here so that even if uh, something were to call out those silverfish, they would get caught in this lava here. I've added lava down below the piston here to catch anybody that manages to squeeze through the piston. And we should be good to try this out. All right, we should be ready to go. So let's throw the switch and see what happens. All right, now what you've just seen happen is what happens when a block reaches our cutoff switch. So when the block hits the cutoff switch, it acts just as if we had turned off the machine. And as you can see, our lights are on, we won't be spawning any more silverfish. Even when I remove that block, this is an RS NOR latch which keeps the cutoff active until I actually press that button and the machine then becomes re reactivated. And now we are ready to build our storage room. All right, I've removed our cutoff circuit and our, our NOR latch that goes with it, and I've replaced it with this smart piston. As these blocks come in here, they're going to get pushed onto this smart piston and it's going to fire and push them up. There's a lever back here powering this block so that as soon as a block gets here, up they go. Now, for the snapshot builds or 1.3, we need to build a block that is 5 by 6 by 6. 6 wide, 6 deep, 5 high. 
Uh, if you're doing this for 1.25, you probably want a block that is 12 by 12 by 7. Um, I'm going to do this for the snapshot builds because uh, it makes for a much smaller room and I think the machine is much more practical there as I've already mentioned. So we're going to build a, a block, that, uh, a row of blocks seven high, or seven high, five high, and we're going to cap it with a furnace just like that so that it can't go any higher. Next we need to build a row of smart pistons to push this row of blocks out. And we're going to build that right back behind it, right there. So let's get these out of the way. There are our pistons. And now we need to build a detector right here that will detect when that block right there is right there is occupied. And so let's just go ahead and build this out here. We're going to do that by putting a repeater here because we want, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to fill this up and push it out towards me and then we're going to push it out that way. So we're going to build our room over on this side. So let's, uh, let's put a torch there and a block here and that will power that and a little bit of redstone over here to pull that out and now all we have to do is wire it back here. You end up with something that looks like this. This area here is where my storage room is going to be. This represents the wall, this represents the floor. Here is my smart, my row of smart pistons here. When a piston gets placed here that turns on this repeater which turns on that block and feed, we feed the power back through the block so as to be able to completely close this area off and then we just build a simple chain of redstone and and repeaters to power all of these pistons right back in here. It's not particularly pretty but it's effective. So now as blocks are placed down in there once it fills up it kicks them out there. Now I need one more row of smart pistons, but this time I need an entire array of smart pistons. And these are going to go right back here. And we end up with something that looks like this. Now we still need to have a smart piston, a smart detector, and we're going to put that right here. Uh, unfortunately that means we have to lose this furnace but that really can't be helped because we need to have a way to get this signal out. So we're going to put a repeater there so when a block appears here it's going to power this repeater which in turn is going to power that block. We'll put a block back there to seal off the rest of the room and here is how we wire it up. Uh, you just add rows of repeaters and put rows of redstone behind that. Put a block with some redstone on it on the other side of that repeater there pulling power from that block. Actually that repeater is technically unnecessary. We could just as easily just replace that with redstone like that. Either way. And then we're going to use a glowstone power ladder to get the power up to each of these levels. This works of course because glowstone doesn't break a circuit so long as the power is traveling up. So that means that the power down there can travel all the way up to here and all the way across to the end. And we're good. That should power the entire block. And it does. Now, if you're going to go bigger, if you've got a 12 long, uh, if you're doing a 12 by 12 room, then this needs to be a, an array of 12 rows of uh, smart pistons so you'll need to take this guy and move it over and put repeaters here put repeaters right here before each of these rows so that the signal can reach all the way down the length of the row um, but with something this small it's not really a problem one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen you got plenty of reach so that's enough to fill your room. Now all we need is a detector on the other side so that we can discover when it's full. And to do that, we are going to put a torch right here. Right there. We'll put a torch. And let's go ahead and put glass there since we've been putting glass everywhere else. 
Put a torch there, put a repeater here, surround that with glass so that nothing can get out like that and put a block behind it and that's where we'll pull our signal out right from there. So once this fills up we will have a block in this position right whoops we will have a block right there which will signal that we've filled the room and that is what we're going to hook up to our cutoff switch just like the one we had before. And here we have the final build. So I've enclosed off the room, completely sealed it off except for this little hole in the top which is high enough that they can't jump out. Um, there are a couple extra little things that I've done. I've hooked this cutoff switch back through here. This is our uh, our NOR latch to trigger the on and off switch. We don't need you, I suppose. Get those guys out of the way. Um, this is the reset switch right here. Uh, now, in addition to the other things that this safety cutoff uh, supports, it also drives these lines high over here, which cause all of the pistons here to extend and that just makes this room completely sealed off with all those pistons out there's no way that the silver fish can glitch behind uh, now uh, I, I will warn you that they still can occasionally glitch behind pistons so it's a good idea to completely seal this stuff off too I haven't done that right now but uh, if you're worried about that you might want to completely seal off even behind these pistons so for instance uh, that wouldn't be a bad idea. But for the most part, this is probably sufficient. A bank of uh, furnaces behind this back wall prevent mishaps in case it should push those rows too far, or if you leave a block behind, like occasionally a, a block might make it through that doesn't actually have a silverfish in it, and if that's left behind here and you forget to clean it up, uh, you'll be glad you had this row of furnaces back here because it'll prevent them from getting pushed through your wall here, your back wall. Uh, one final nice little touch is to put a door down in the lower corner of your room, not in the wall that the pistons face. <laughs> put them in a different wall. But if you put a door here, then you have an easy way to get in or get out. Uh, if you decide you want to shut the machine off prematurely, like you want to shut it off before it's fill, uh, filled the whole thing, the easiest way to do that is to just come down here and put a block there and trigger it yourself. So that's one reason I haven't installed a switch for that. But we should be ready to try it out. Let's go down, hit that, let's hit that master switch there. And let's see what we get. And there you are. She's full. Well, thank you for sticking with me for this. This is a long tutorial, I know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just uh, know that it took me a lot longer to make it than it took you to watch it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Uh, I'm going to include this build in the link below. Feel free to download it and pick it apart and uh, see what you can do to add to it. Uh, as always, it's great talking to you. Thanks for being along. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, share, like, subscribe, do what you do. Uh, we will talk to you again later.